Dr. Jyoti Hermit. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of English, Ewing Christian College. The topic of my lecture is World Wars and Women's Voices, Paper 2, Module 7. Women's position during the wars reflected a changing attitude towards their roles. Largely, this change began just before the outbreak of war with the cry of women to have the vote, a movement which sought improvement in their position in society, which until then had disenfranchised them. Not only was there a cry for the vote, but surprisingly to some, women also wished to take an active part in the war and not be excluded on the grounds of their gender. Women writers in the 20th century found it much more difficult than men to have their work published and consequently their work is often less well known than the work of men of the same period. The reasons for this are not based on merit but on the social and political climate of the time. Women's writings on the First World War have been misunderstood as inauthentic and unrealistic. This is mostly due to the fact that by 1914 and until late uh, 1918, women did not do military service. Much of the testimony about the Great War has been dictated by male reports or soldiers' accounts in which men acclaimed exclusiveness. The combatant's voice was more authentic or realistic than the civilian's. Margaret Higanet points out that many of the letters written by women in wartime were censored or confiscated. Feminist newspapers often appeared blank and other forms of suppression took place. For example, Marcel Cappy's collection of journalism in Higonet lines of fire, women war writers of the First World War was not allowed to be reprinted. Unfortunately, most women's writings on the war were seen as leading to misconceptions or simply disregarded by the time they were written. The World Wars shook up gender relations, but only temporarily. Individual British women in the world wars found new freedoms and opportunities and wartime like being let out of a cage in one woman's words. However, gender changes were short-lived. Attitudes towards women's role at home and at work remained remarkably consistent over nearly 50 years. Both wars put conventional views about gender roles under strain, but no permanent change occurred in hostility to women in male-dominated jobs, the devaluation of female labor, and the female only responsibility for home life. Several major differences distinguish 
the two world wars effects on women. Most importantly, in terms of gender roles, women in the military in the first war were largely confined to very mundane work like cleaning, cooking, clerical work, waitressing and some driving. But in 1939 to 1945, in addition, women handled anti-aircraft guns, ran the communications network, mended aeroplanes and even flew them from base to base. Nonetheless, gender relations quickly reverted to tradition after World War II as after World War I. In touch and intimacy in First World War literature, Shantanu Das refers to women as being silent witnesses. Despite the general feeling of hopelessness, many women remained diligent and their social roles evolved in ways unexpected by their societies. Some were political activists such as Alexandra Kolonitai, Marcel Cappé or Rebecca West. Others took part directly in war like Catherine Hodges North who enlisted in 1916 as an ambulance driver. Many others like Vera Britton served as a nurse in the war and used her writing to describe the horror of losing loved ones and sharing the feelings of having her life completely shattered by the war. A clear understanding of the term feminism is crucial before one embarks on the topic of feminist writings. Feminism as a social, political, economic and intellectual movement has been defined variously over 200 years. The current consensus is that there is no one feminism but in fact many traditions within a larger movement dedicated to securing equality for women. Simply put, feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation and oppression. This was the definition of feminism offered by Bell Hooks in a feminist theory from margin to center more than a decade ago. Feminism has reshaped the overriding perspectives in a wide range of areas within Western society, ranging from culture to law. During much of its history, most of the leaders of the feminist movements and theories were predominantly middle-class white women from Western Europe and North America. However, at least since Sojourner Truth's 1851 speech to American feminists, women of other races have proposed alternative feminisms. This trend gained momentum in the 1960s with the civil rights movement in the United States and the collapse of European colonization in Africa, the Caribbean, parts of Latin America and Southeast Asia. Since that time, women in former European colonies and the third world nations have proposed post-colonial and third world feminisms.
Some post-colonial feminists such as Chandra Talpade Mohanty disapprove Western feminism for being ethnocentric. Black feminists such as Angela Davis and Alice Walker share this view. Simone de Boer wrote that the first time we see a woman take up her pen in defense of her sex was Christine de Pizan, who wrote for the first time for women and about women. Pizan's The Book of the City of Women was published in 14. First wave feminism refers to the feminist activity during the 19th century and early 20th century in the United Kingdom and the United States. Originally, the promotion of equal contract, property rights for women, the opposition to chattel marriage and ownership of married women and the children by the husbands were the points of focus. In Britain, the suffragettes and the suffragists campaigned for the women's right to vote. In 1918, the representation of the People Act 1918 was sanctioned, granting women above 30 years of age who own houses the right to vote. In 1928, this was extended to all women over the age of 21. In the United States, leaders of this movement included Lucretia Mott, Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, who each campaigned for the abolition of slavery prior to championing women's right to vote, all were strongly influenced by Quaker thought. American first wave feminism involved women of various political and religious outlooks. Some, like Frances Willard, associated with conservative Christian groups, such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Others, such as Matilda Joslyn Gage, who was a suffragist, a Native American rights activists were more radical and asserted their ideals within the National Women Suffrage Association or individually. American first wave feminism is considered to have ended with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1919, granting women the right to vote in all states. Second wave feminism is the period of activity in the early 1960s and lasting through the late 1980s. Eminent critic Emilda Whelan proposes that the second wave was a continuation of the earlier phase of feminism involving the suffragettes in the UK and USA. Second wave feminism has persisted since that time and coexists with what is termed as the third wave feminism. Estella Friedman compares first and second wave feminism with the first wave focusing on rights such as suffrage, whereas the second being largely concerned 
with other issues of equality such as ending discrimination. Feminist critical thinker Carol Hanish launched several prominent feminist groups and protests during the heydays of radical feminism. It was she who gave the phrase, the personal is political in 1969, which became synonymous with the second wave of feminism. Kate Millett is an American feminist literary critic. She has been described as a seminal influence on second wave feminism and is best known for her 1970 book, Sexual Politics. French author and philosopher Simone de Beauvoir is best known for her treatise, The Second Sex, a detailed analysis of women's subjugation and the cornerstone of contemporary feminism. Written in 1949, its English translation was published in 1953. Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963, criticized the idea that women have found fulfillment solely through child rearing and homemaking. According to Friedan's obituary in the New York Times, the feminine mystique ignited the contemporary women's movement in 1963 and as a result permanently transformed the social fabric of the United States and countries around the world and is regarded as one of the most influential non-fiction books of the 20th century. Third wave feminism arose as a response to the perceived failures of the second wave in the early 1990s. It was also a reaction to the backlash against initiatives and movements which were created by the second wave. Third wave feminism endeavors to challenge or avoid what it deems the second wave's essentialist definition of femininity which according to them overemphasized the experience of upper middle class white women. A post structuralist exposition of gender and sexuality is central to much of the third wave's ideology. Feminist leaders rooted in the second wave like Gloria Anzaldua, Bell Hooks, Chela Sandoval, Cherry Moraga, Audre Lord, Maxine Hong Kingston and many other black feminists essay a negotiation for a space within feminist thought for consideration of race related subjectivities. The term post feminism was earliest used in Susan Bolotin's 1982 article Voices of the Post Feminist Generation, published in New York Times Magazine. The term was first used in the 1980s to describe a backlash against second wave feminism. In her book, Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women, 1991, Susan Faludi argues that the women's liberation movement was constructed by it as the root of innumerable problems which allegedly plagued women in the late 1980s. French feminism compared to Anglophone feminism is 
distinguished by a more philosophical and literary approach. It refers to a branch of feminist thought from a group of feminists in France between 1970s to the 1990s. The term includes non-French writers who have notably worked in France and the French tradition such as Julia Kristeva and Braca Ettinger. Julia Kristeva has greatly influenced feminist theory and particularly feminist literary criticism. 1980 onwards, the work of Braca Ettinger, an artist and psychoanalyst, has influenced literary criticism, art, history and film theory. The American literary critic and feminist Elaine Show Walter describes the development of feminist theory in three phases. The first is that of feminist critique, in which the ideologies behind literary phenomena are examined by the feminist reader. The second show Walter calls gynocriticism, sorry. The second show Walter calls gynocriticism in which the woman is producer of textual meaning. Anarcha feminism, also called anarchist feminism or anarcho feminism, combines anarchism with feminism. It views patriarchy as a manifestation of involuntary hierarchy. Anarcha feminists call the struggle against patriarchy essential. Important historic anarcha feminists include Emma Goldman, Frederica Monseni, Walterin D. Clare, and Lucy Parsons. Socialist feminism links the oppression of women to Marxist ideas about exploitation, oppression, and labor. Socialist feminists believe that women are held down in workplace and in the domestic sphere because of unequal standing. They find prostitution, domestic work, child care, and marriage as ways of women's exploitation by a patriarchal system that belittles women and their substantial work. They emphasize and point out the need to work alongside men as well as other groups as they see the oppression of women as a part of a larger pattern that affects the entire capitalist system. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, both Clara Zetkin and Eleanor Marx were against the demonetization of men. They supported a proletarian revolution that would overcome as many male-female inequalities as possible. Radical feminism considers the male-controlled capitalist hierarchy, sexist in nature, as the defining feature of women's oppression. Radical feminists believe that women can be free only when they try to take a plunge out of an inherent, oppressive and dominating patriarchal system. They feel that the oppression and inequality of women is carried out by the hands of a male-based authority and power structure. A number of subtypes of radical feminisms have emerged over time such as cultural feminism, separatist feminism, and anti-pornography feminism. Cultural feminism is the ideology of a female nature or female essence that attempts to revalidate those female attributes which are undervalued. It stresses on the difference between women and men but considers that difference to be psychological and culturally constructed rather than biologi biologically innate. 
Its critics assert that because of its ideology and advocating independence and institution building, it has led feminists to retreat from politics to lifestyle. Alice Eccles is a feminist historian and cultural theorist. She credits Red Stockings member Brooke Williams with introducing the term cultural feminism in 1975 to describe the depoliticization of radical feminism. Separatist feminism does not support heterosexual relationships. Its proponents contend that the sexual disparities between men and women are unresolvable. Separatist feminists generally believe men incapable of making positive contributions to the feminist movement. They also hold that the well-intentioned men too replicate patriarchal dynamics. Liberal feminism aims at the equality of men and women through political and legal reform. It is an individualistic form of feminism which emphasizes women's ability to show and maintain their equality through their own actions and choices. Liberal feminism uses the personal interaction between men and women as the crux to transform society. According to liberal feminists, since all women are capable of asserting their ability to achieve equality, a change in the society can happen without altering it. Issues like reproductive and abortion rights, sexual harassment, voting, education, equal pay for equal work, affordable childcare, affordable health care and bringing to light the frequency of sexual and domestic violence against women are issues critical to liberal feminists. Black feminists argue that sexism, class oppression and racism are inextricably bound together. Many forms of feminism which strive to overcome sexism and class oppression but ignore race are capable of discriminating against many people including women through racial bias. Alice Walker's theory of womanism was an important theory to evolve out of this movement. Alice Walker and other womanists pointed out that the oppression experienced by black women was different and more than that of white women. Angela Davis was one of the first to articulate an argument centered on the intersection of race, gender and class in her book, Women, Race and Class. Thus, feminism exceeds both the mundane listings of its characteristics and of its summarized types. It has an incremental quality that is not so easily reducible. And one aspect of this arises in relation to its felt connotations. Feminism and the women voices are as relevant as ever before the 20th century. Feminism and the women voices are as relevant as ever before in the 20th century. The movement requires all the support it can get to make this the century of true gender justice. Thank you.